They are as important as the rockets of the astronauts flying and a miracle of materials and clothing engineering. Without them, we would not have been able to walk on the moon. But the current generation of spacesuits or extravehicular mobility units, which were designed in the late 1970s, are now 25 years beyond their design brief. NASA has spent the last 14 years and by the time it's ready getting on for over a billion dollars on the latest version of their next generation spacesuits. And yet they still won't be ready for the Artemis man moon missions when they start in 2024, which threatens to derail the whole project, not to mention the problem with the ISS spacesuits. So why has it taken so long to replace a spacesuit that is 45 years old? Our sponsor for this video is Morning Brew. Morning Brew is a free daily newsletter that brings you the latest news on a whole range of subjects in an informative, witty and relevant manner. For example, I found out that Reddit is now valued at $10 billion following its latest funding injection from Fidelity. Sounds like a lot, but it's still got a long way to go to catch up with the likes of Twitter and Facebook. And that Apple is getting both praised and blasted for its new update that will scan US iPhones for images of child abuse, but have also been uploaded to iCloud, with some saying that this new feature could be used to alert the authorities to anything that they or the government decides they want to control. If you're interested in business, finance or tech, then there's no reason not to subscribe to Morning Brew. It's completely free, takes less than 15 seconds to subscribe, and all you need to do is click on the link in the description below to get smarter in five minutes every day. Although the term spacesuit is most commonly used, the ones we see performing EVAs around the ISS and walking on the moon back in the 60s are actually extravehicular mobility units or EMUs. These are effectively personal spacecraft designed to keep the occupant alive outside in the vacuum of space where they would normally be in a conventional spacecraft. To do this and retain the ability to move around and work in space for up to eight hours is actually a pretty tall order. There is a whole range of things that the EMU must do to keep its occupant not only alive, but also comfortable enough to allow them to perform complex jobs for extended periods. Before Apollo, spacewalks were done with spacesuits that were attached to the spacecraft by an umbilical cord. With the moon missions, that would not be possible if they were to explore more than a few meters away from the lunar lander. To enable this, new, much tougher and more flexible spacesuits for the lunar surface would be required and a portable life support system, or PLSS, would be built into a backpack and carried by each of the astronauts, which is where the transition from a spacesuit to the EMU began. Up to the Apollo 14 mission, this was the A7L EMU, and on the Apollo 15, 16 and 17 missions, it was the extensively revised A7LB EMU, which was used on the longer J series missions. They were also used on the Skylab missions, but with an umbilical system called the Astronaut Life Support Assembly. Two companies made the EMU, ILC made the spacesuit and Hamilton Standard, the PLSS. The PLSS backpack would supply all the oxygen to breathe and the electrical power to maintain a constant pressure in the vacuum of space and to remove the expelled carbon dioxide with a rebreathing system so that oxygen breathed out could be reused and not lost. The EMUs also provided the communications equipment and the liquids that maintained a constant temperature in the suit, even though the exterior could be subjected to temperature swings from minus 156 degrees C in the shade to plus 121 degrees C in direct sunlight. The spacesuit itself had 11 layers of insulation and protection split into three parts. But in space, the biggest problem became keeping the person cool inside the suit. This was done by a three layer liquid cooling and ventilation undergarment, which had over 100 meters of fine tubing built in which covered the body and which water was pumped through. This also cut down on the sweating and the subsequent fogging of the suit helmet visor. 
temperature control was done with a porous sublimation plate that water from the cooling and ventilation garment ran over on one side whilst the other was exposed to the vacuum of space outside. The plate had pores sized just so that if the water flowing under the plate became warmer than a comfortable level, the frozen water in the plate would thaw, allowing the water to boil off into the vacuum of space, taking the heat with it. As the water temperature dropped, the water refroze, stopping the cooling process. This automatic temperature control system was simple yet effective and worked without sensors, electronics, or any moving parts. The second part was a flexible pressure suit that would hold its shape even when pressurized in a vacuum. The pressure suit also had to keep a constant volume independent of the movements that were performed. This was to keep the amount of effort required to do any movement to an absolute minimum. If you've ever worn a stiff pair of gloves that naturally keep your hands straight and then try to do any intricate work where you have to bend the fingers for long periods, you'll know that the extra effort to overcome the glove stiffness can become fatiguing very quickly. The same can happen if the entire suit is similarly stiff, making it difficult to work for longer periods. The third part was a protection layer made from a material called beta cloth. This was made from a Teflon coated woven fiberglass that protected up to 650 degrees C, well beyond the wide temperature swings that the suit would be exposed to. It also protected against high levels of ultraviolet light and some particle radiation. This outer layer also protected against micro meteor impacts at up to 27,000 kilometers per hour, something that was a particular issue on the later EMUs when working outside of the ISS. The gloves for the suit were the most difficult to make because they had to be flexible enough to be able to pick up a coin and yet tough enough to stop a bullet. In the end, the outsides were made from a new material called Chromel R, which was a woven chromium steel, which at the time cost $2,000 per meter and was difficult to work with, but it worked very well. The spacesuit also had to handle the waste products, both liquids and solids that the astronaut might produce. In the Apollo era, they used attachments that were stuck to the body under a pair of spandex trunks. In the later 1978 design, which is still in use today, they use a maximum absorbency garment, basically an adult nappy. Though in both cases, the astronaut would go to the loo before the start of an EVA, and the in-suit drinking liquids were there for comfort rather than necessity. Thus, they could minimize the amount they would need to excrete whilst in the EMU. With the advent of the Space Shuttle in 1978, a new baseline EMU was developed, which has remained similar up until today and is still used by the ISS by the US crews. The Russian crews have used their own spacesuit designs. This 1978 design had an expected lifespan of 15 years, but has now been in use for over 40 years. As the ISS has been given more time, the costs of looking after the aging EMU design is mounting and now poses other more serious issues with reliability due to the loss of component suppliers and the lack of critical components. The primary life support system, or the backpack, is the most complicated and most expensive part of the EMU and currently costs $150 million a year to maintain the 11 serviceable units used to support the ISS. But there are other more serious issues with decompression sickness, thermal regulation, shoulder and hand injuries to name a few. The Aerospace Safety Advisory Panel has recommended that NASA transition to newer XEMUs as soon as possible, as the old suits are now too risky for astronauts to use. The development of the EMUs has been over decades by several different external contractors, but with the new push into space and onto the moon by NASA, there is a need to make a new EMU system that would work in a modern, digitally connected way, be more flexible and more inclusive of a greater range of body types, both male and female, and address the existing problems with the 1978 design and design issues carried over from the Apollo era. It would also need to work over a wider range of systems, including the Human Lander System, or the HLS, Gateway Program, the Orion Capsule, and of course, the ISS. A quick comparison of the old EMU and the new XEMU can be seen here. 
NASA started work some 14 years ago, investing $420 million so far in spacesuit development. But in 2017, NASA decided it would design, test and build all the new XEMUs in-house for the first time in 40 years, working with 27 different contractors. However, whilst NASA has been working on its spacesuit, it provided access to the designs to the contractors, but does not require them to use its designs. So we could end up with a scenario where we would have two different designs which NASA would end up having to purchase, one for the lunar missions and the other for the ISS, pushing up the costs and creating further delays, considering the limited lifespan that the ISS has. Before 2019, NASA was scheduled to produce flight-ready XEMUs for the ISS by 2023 and the Artemis III mission, which was due in 2028. But in 2019, the Artemis moon landing goal was moved forward by four years to 2024. There was a 12-month margin built into the XEMU schedule, but with the still unfolding COVID-19 issues, budget cuts and technical issues, have now introduced approximately 20 months of delay into the schedule, meaning they are now about eight months behind. Before they can be used on the ISS or the Artemis program, the new XEMUs will be required for crew training for at least 12 months, and normally two years before they are deployed. With these delays, it's now looking like the first two flight-ready XEMUs won't be ready until at least 2024. The bringing forward of the Artemis program also to 2024, the aging ISS spacesuit issues and other issues which are of NASA's own creation, has created a perfect storm, which means that the late 2024 lunar landings probably won't be possible, and the costs of the design, testing, and qualification of the spacesuit is expected to be over a billion dollars. These are not the only issues that the return to the moon poses. The lander system is still in its early design phase, and there are still issues to work out with the SLS rocket and the Orion capsule, but the XEMUs are the common link across all the space programs, and as such, they are now the Achilles heel for the American manned space program. If you're interested in finding out more about the ongoing development of the NASA next-gen spacesuits, there is a new report from the Office of Audits. The link is in the description, which makes some interesting, but also rather depressing reading. So I hope you enjoyed the video, and if you did, then please thumbs up, subscribe, click the bell notification, and share. And I'd also like to say a big thank you to all our patrons out there for their ongoing support.